Hello, Mark. Can you tell us uh, what the status of the project is? Uh, it's been in the works for quite some time, and just kind of give us an overview of the project and when we can expect Volume 1. Okay, gladly. Um, well, Volume 1 uh, ought to be out in uh, 2012. That's what we're aiming for. Um, so it's nearly there. I've been working on it for about eight years now. Um, the working title is The Beatles, The Complete Story. I don't know if it's going to stay that way, but that's what it is at the moment. And um, everything is on track, except that we're running a little bit behind time. But um, the idea of the book is, is you know, it's, it's still exactly as it was back in 2003 when I, I first came up with it, which is that it's really an attempt to tell the Beatles story like it's never been told before. It's a, it's a well-told story, but I always contended that it was not a a well-told story, if you know what I mean. Um, it's been told a lot, but never very well. And I always felt that it could be told better. And that's what the aim is, really, to absolutely get this right. I mean, the Beatles, you know, they, they are the biggest band of the 20th century, and they changed so much, and they're still huge in the 21st century. And yet, there isn't really the one book that absolutely explains how it all happened and, and looks at it properly, accurately, comprehensively, and with a kind of proper understanding. So that's the idea. Um, it's, <laughs> it's a vast job. It's uh, probably about a 20-year project, full-time. Um, but I'm very happy about that because it needs to be done, and I'm very happy to be the one who's actually doing it. So 2012 is the date we're shooting for, and um, I'm just about on track for that. And your publishers? Um, well, I've been very, very happy uh, to say that my publishers have been really patient with me. Uh, they were expecting the first volume out in 2008, uh, and here I am in 2011 still writing it. So uh, I'm enormously grateful uh, to them for their patience. That's um, Little Brown in the UK, Crown in America, and Kuwait Shoba Shinsha in Japan. They've all been incredibly tolerant of this. But they've read the material and um, they've read what I've written so far and for that reason alone I think they're staying right on track because this is going to be something very special and uh, I'm, you know, it's taking longer than we thought but it is going to be worth the wait. Well I'm telling the Beatles story in, in three volumes so obviously there has to be a division between each one and I um, thought very very long and hard about that. The first volume ends New Year's Eve 1962, with the Beatles on the very cusp of their breakthrough, but with everything having fallen right into place, all the people, the personalities, the situations, the arrangements. Um, the question was always, when does it actually begin? Uh, I mean, the Beatles were born during the Second World War, um, and they really started, you know, they formed a band, if you like, in '57. But the story actually is a, a deeper and broader one than that because I'm writing a, a contextual history in which I really do try to explain every single element of the Beatles. And that includes their family background. So, long answer to a short question, um, the book actually begins in about 1845. <laughs> It doesn't linger there for very long, and there's a very good reason why it does begin there. Um, pretty soon, however, we're into the 20th century, and through the Second World War, and then we're into Beatle childhoods, and, you know, their families and the circumstances of their education, their influences, and, of course, we very quickly get to the point where America is having a huge impact on them, and, you know, from about mid-1950s, the book is, is very solid in so volume one begins at the uh, ends of the end of 1962, which means that volume two begins at the very start of 1963. And that goes on till, I'm not actually certain yet, um, 1966 or 67. And volume three will pick up from there and go to uh, probably the early 1970s, I would think. Um, the plans have all changed since the book came, uh, was first proposed. but. Um, I've been actually doing a fair bit of the research of volumes two and three uh, whilst writing the first volume, so they won't take as long to write, and I'm pretty optimistic that they're going to be you know, fairly tightly behind the first volume at uh, regular intervals. But the first volume will be out, I'm, as I say, we're shooting in uh, August, uh, in autumn 2012. Yeah. Now, Mark, you've dug up and you're still digging up lots of fresh information and discovering many pieces to the puzzle. 
Uh, what have you discovered along the way that surprised you the most? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that one. Not yet. We're a little too ahead of publication for that. But believe me, I've found so much. I mean, I've been surprised literally every day uh, about just how many things I didn't know. And I've been researching this story since, well, since the 1970s. So um, the, the point is, you know, really I'm on the the turf of biographers, if you like, and really very few of them have spent that long writing their books or dedicating particular amounts of, you know, long time to them. And um, the moment you start digging, the more you start finding gold and you keep finding gold. I mean, the Beatles story is remarkable because no matter how deep you dig, you still find gold. And uh, even since I started writing and I kind of shut down the research element, I'm still finding people who are telling me amazing things. I mean, a couple of girls, for example, that I tracked down who managed them for a while. <laughs> that was quite a nice discovery. And, uh, well, all sorts of things. I mean, a few people have read the raw manuscript, uh, people who know the subject well, and they tell me that on every single page, bar none, they are finding things that make them go, wow. And, um, and I genuinely, I can believe that because I can see it myself when I'm writing it. And I'm not adding anything. There's no embroidery here. There's no, the Beatles story is so rich, you don't need to add anything for it to already be the best story there'll ever be. And, you know, my contention that it had never been told properly is so true because really when you spend proper time on it and you dig deep and deep and deep and you find gold, it's fantastic. So there's something on every page and it's going to be told in a way that really makes sense. It's a combination of thousands of new discoveries that are really interesting, coupled with a fresh way of looking at what we do already know. So even, I mean, I can't, you know, they played the Ed Sullivan show, okay? I, you know, that's not going to be a surprise to anybody. But how the Ed Sullivan show happened, and really what went on on that day, for example, is going to be completely fresh to people. So it's not a discovery that they played on Ed Sullivan, but it's going to be a wow moment for the reader. So imagine that all the way through and you've got it. You know. Now, Mark, this being the digital multimedia age, what forms will the book take when it's published? Um, well, um, it's an interesting time to be writing a book because obviously the book market is in a state of change. Um, there's going to be an e-book, I'm sure of that. Um, there will no doubt be other electronic delights, um, probably podcasts. I would imagine there's going to be a good website. I have a ton of material to put up on a, on a website for this book. Um, and also in terms of paper, we mustn't forget paper. This really is a book still. The idea is this book is going to be around for as long as the Beatles are going to be around. Uh, that's what the publishers have, have bought into, and um, that's what I'm delivering them. So we're actually looking at a kind of a mass market edition for, for the general public, if you like, uh, of about 250,000 words. And we're looking at an author's cut edition. Um, the, the whole book, because I've actually written a fair bit more than, than 250,000. Um, and that's going to be some kind of a, a limited edition book or something like that, something with added value, not too expensive, I hope. Uh, I want to always be friendly to the public in terms of you know, making sure that they're happy with what they've got and that they're happy with what they pay for. Um, but at the same time, here is an opportunity, since I have written probably more than twice what the publishers actually are expecting me to write, um, we'll actually do that as a book as well. So, you know, it's, it's going to be very exciting. We're going to try and cross all the media platforms and uh, be unavoidable. That's it. Now, Mark, describe a day in the life at your office while you're working on the Beatles history. Okay. Um, well, I work from home. This is a little bit of my office, uh, a library, as I call it. Um, and um, I get up about, um, I'm at my desk by half past five, typically. Uh, and I work through until, well, it all depends whether my wife is around or not. If she's, uh, if she's not out for the evening, then I'll probably work um, until about 7 o'clock in the evening and then spend the time with her. But if she is out in the evening, I'll just go on until about, well, until I fall over about 11 o'clock at night, really. Um, my eldest son calls it um, a 5 to 9 working day, 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, and it's, it's full on, you know. I mean, this is what I do. I'm very, very dedicated 
but I happen to love what I do, so it's it's no great hardship. And the difficulty is in switching off, really. So being here and actually writing the book is it, it kind of monopolizes your life. And um, but no problem with that, except that you know ultimately I could do with a break. But um, it's it's a good hard working day. I write for about about twelve hours a day typically, and the rest of the time I'm looking things up and making contact with people and, you know, emailing and stuff like that. But generally speaking, it's a very, very long working day, but a happy one. Now, Mark, out of all of the media outlets around the world that you could have spoken to, why did you choose to speak to People's Place exclusively to give this update? Well, I don't normally talk to the media, uh, certainly not while I'm writing. Uh, I mean, there'll be plenty of opportunity to talk about the book when it's out, but I did feel that since people have been waiting for this book very patiently, it was really high time that I reassured them that it is actually still on the agenda, that it is happening, and it will be out um, before too long. Um, and really, you know, on the web, somewhere is everywhere now. Um, I mean, one could go with a major network or one could stick with, you know, any, anybody that's putting it out on YouTube or Twitter or whatever. Uh, but it's really nice, actually, to be doing it with, with you, Stephen. Um, Stephen K. Peoples of People's Place. Um, because, you know, I've known you a very long time, and I know that you're doing always doing very good work. And I know that you'll actually understand what it is I'm trying to put across. So, so it's nice to be here on People's Place. Uh, I couldn't think of a better place to, to actually do this. Now, Mark, what would you say to Beatles fans who were anxious to see Volume 1 yesterday? <laughs> Uh, I would say I'm sorry for keeping you waiting. I know from some of the things on the web that you're impatient to see it. Uh, I'm impatient to see it, but uh, it's been delayed for the best reason of all, which is that the book is just getting better and better and better. If there are no corners being cut here. I'm not speeding up um, just so I can get it out when people think it, you know, think it should be out. It's being done right, and that's the best way, but it is nearly, nearly done. So thank you for your patience. And um, the point is, this is this book is about you know the biggest band, and uh, it has no agenda. So honesty and clarity and understanding is what it's all about, and that's what you're going to get. So thanks for being patient, and it'll be with you soon. That's Beatles historian Mark Lewison live from London via Skype. Thanks, Mark, for talking with us exclusively on People's Place. Thank you, Stephen. It's been a pleasure to be on People's Place, and we'll do it again when the book is out, OK? Bye for now. Tune In is the first volume of uh, a three-volume series called All These Years, which attempts to tell, um, in a way that it's never been told before, uh, the, the real story of the Beatles um, and a contextual telling of their story, so that it's, it's, it's the Beatles in, in a setting, uh, in, in the period in which they were you know, living all these years, basically. So uh, it's a biography, it's a history, it's, it's comprehensive, it's, it's deep, it's scholarly, um, but it's also funny like they were. Uh, it's uh, a real page turner because they did such interesting things. Uh, and it's an attempt to, to really get this right once and for all. We, we, there are an awful lot of books on the Beatles, all these and a great many more besides. Um, but I, I've always felt that the one that their story deserves uh, had, has yet to be written. People would think, this is ridiculous. You know, this is only the first part of the Beatles story. You've written, in the end, nearly 800,000 words. And that is, you know, quite obviously vast amounts of stuff that no one's interested in. But it isn't like that. This is a, a it's not just me that thinks it as well. This is a truly extraordinary story full of extraordinary people doing extraordinary things all the time. The Beatles were very funny. Well, they didn't suddenly become funny when they made A Hard Day's Night. You know, they didn't suddenly be become artistically progressive when they were making Revolver or Sgt. Pepper. They didn't suddenly develop a personality when they went on television in 1963. This is who they always were. And they were always doing all that kind of interesting stuff, progressive stuff, making things up as they went along, not ad ad adhering to other people's rules even when they weren't known. So th the same dynamic Beatles that are going to appear in the years that people do know about, they're in this book too. Um, so the book is written actually very lean. 
there's nothing in there that doesn't need to be there in order to understand who these people were. It's absolutely rooted in documentation. My number one collection, uh, the number one aspect of my collection is information, letters, contracts, all, every kind of possible uh, piece of documentation. And if you use that, then you've got a very solid grounding for being correct. And that's where it starts, really. The, the essence of this project is we're cutting no corners. Absolutely no corners are being cut, because what's the point? It's never going to be done as thoroughly again. Um, so we might as well do absolutely everything we can to get it right. The Beatles are this legend. They are this immense thing that have just, they're, they're just like, they're almost not people anymore. They're just John, Paul, George and Ringo. They're the Beatles. They're gods. They're not. They're just people. Live, living lives like all of us live. But they, they just take different paths, different directions. They have different goals and ultimately it gets them higher than they could ever imagine. But they are just people and this is a very human story. So I, I'm always, I'm taking the reader always inside their houses, um, inside the clubs, inside the van when they were traveling around. It's, it's, and with them very much real at the center of it, it's their story. It's, it's great, you know, this is what I want to do. This is, this is actually, I, I kind of feel this is what I was put on the planet to do, you know. I was actually, I, I'm meant to be doing this. So here I am. Uh, you are lucky enough to hear all the Beatles recordings. I made a fantastic book. And uh, I want to know, how do you feel when you heard all those songs and how it was for you? Well, it's 25, 26 years ago now, yeah. although I did hear them all again when I did the anthology project with George Martin, but it was extraordinary because as a child I loved the Beatles and I used to walk past Abbey Road Studios when I was like 11 years old and think, what's it like in there? And then to be actually invited in to work at Abbey Road for several months, to be able to go and get the tapes off the shelf and put them on the machine, it was an extremely nice feeling. But also at the same time I had a job to do. I wasn't just there to enjoy myself. Though I did enjoy myself, I was there to write a book. So I, and I had a, quite a tight deadline. So I had to be professional, um, be very happy, but be professional at the same time. And how was your emotions? It was easy to hold or difficult? How oh, easy. It's easy. easy. <laughs> some people, um, you know, have easy control over their emotions and some don't, and I do. So, I mean, I was, my insides were, were leaping, but outwardly I was being professional. Okay. So, you know, when you're getting involved, invited into things like this, if you start behaving like a fan, and, oh my god, I can't believe it, and all that, <laughs> then you may not be invited back. Yeah. So I you know, have to be aware that I'm there for a reason to do a job, and they know that I'm interested, but at the same time, I've got to do the job. Okay. Let's talk to Mark Lewisome. He's a Beatles historian, and he worked with Sir George Martin on many projects, including a documentary series, The Beatles Anthology. Mark, tell us what he was like. <laughs> he was what you saw. He was a gentleman and a scholar. He was um, amusing. He had a fantastic sense of humour. And he had the the producer's uh, actual talent of, of bringing the best out of the people around him. Um, it's so easy for people in that position to let their ego be the dominant one. Um, but George Martin was always incredibly receptive. He knew his job was to be receptive to other people's talents and to bring the best out in them and he certainly did that he was i mean many people will know this but some weren't he was he was a class he was classically trained but he was he, he didn't learn music at school he didn't know learn how to read music at school he taught himself he composed music i think his first piece called the spider's dance was composed when he was about six or seven years old a kind of ragtime cla like classical ragtime piano piece wow. um you can now get that on a cd and he was obviously very musically inclined but his parents didn't have a lot of money he was brought up in he lived in kind of highbury north london um and then was evacuated to bromley during the early part of the second world war uh, eventually he served in the war, but he was evacuated at the beginning of it and was at a school, I think, in Bromley 
when the BBC Symphony Orchestra came and um, performed uh, Debussy's, I think it was Claire de Lune or something like that. Um, and he was wafted away to heaven, as he called it, and deeply in love with music from that point on and wanted to make it his career. Ended up going to the Guildhall School of Music from 1948 to 1950. Um, no fee was due on that. I think um, there was a grant, a scholarship was, was found. And he then left there and went into record production, but it wasn't called that then. He was just working in the studio at EMI at Abbey Road for Parlophone Records, producing uh, and being involved in the creation of sounds right across the spectrum of music from classical to opera to um, novelty records, humor records and jazz, of course, and then eventually rock and roll, skiffle and the Beatles. And explain to our audience why he was so important to the success of the Beatles music. Well, they were great rebels. They never wanted to do anything that, um, if, if anybody said to the Beatles, you can't do that, um, then they would say, who says we can't do that? Yes, we will. And in George Martin, they had a producer who absolutely empathized with that point of view. He too was a maverick. He wanted to break the rules. If there was a rule, you'd break it. And, and that's what they did together in the hands of another record producer who was might have denied them their, their the ultimate expression of their talent. Um, the Beatles could have sounded quite different in the recording studio. But similarly, from the Beatles' point of view, um, they, were, they were the perfect artists for Sir George because they wanted to try something different every time and that suited his manner perfectly. Which made them, uh, yeah, a, a really, really good combination, which is kind of the understatement of the, the day so far. Yeah, well, as we just heard Sir George telling how a good all, it made the studio a creative workshop and, and the Beatles didn't have to pay for their recording sessions. It was all part of their contract with EMI that they were just part of the deal. So they could spend as long as they liked in the recording studio. In the last three or four years, they were in there, they'd stop performing live on stage. And George Martin was just the facilitator of whatever they wanted. And quite often they didn't need Sir George around, but very often they did. And um, whatever they needed, he was the man for it. If John wanted the strings on Strawberry Fields Forever, George would, would score that. Uh, and conduct it. If George wanted the uh, string arrangement on Within You, Without You, his Indian number, George was the perfect person. And of course, for Paul McCartney, we think of Yesterday or Eleanor Rigby or For No One, any of those tracks. But he he, he did more than just conduct and arrange. He was, he was their sounding board. They respected him and he respected them. And what we have in our record collections and the world's music bank is the sound of people who respected one another in the studio. Is it true the, fir the first time the Beatles were recording, he, uh, Sir George, M George Martin, as he then was, went off to the canteen and left them to it? It's a long story, but actually um, George had turned them down along with most other people who had turned them down. The, the Beatles were rejected by everyone because they were so new and so different. Um, but in the end, George Martin signed them and then he met them. And when he met them, well, initially he wasn't even in on their first session. Um, but when he met them, he recognized right away that these were people he wanted to be with. Um, he was turned on by their personalities, by their charisma. They in turn liked him very much because he appeared to be like a schoolmaster, if you like. They called him the school, the head teacher. Um, but on the other hand, um, he was someone that they could actually have a joke with. He would make self-deprecating remarks about himself. Uh, and they really took to him straight away. And it became a beautiful relationship from about five months after they first met. They, they really clicked in the end of 1962. And the Beatles' breakthrough was so extraordinarily rapid that um, George Martin became the hottest producer uh, in the world. 1964, March of 64, he was point, it was pointed out to him that in the preceding 15 months, he had spent 37 weeks at number one on the charts. 37 weeks out of about um, 65 weeks. Quite an incredible run. It'll never be repeated because he didn't only have the Beatles, he had Scylla Black and Jerry and the Pacemakers and Shirley Bassey and Matt Monroe and so many talents. Mark, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Mark Lewison, Beatles historian and uh, a man who worked with Sir George Martin on many projects. 1962 was undoubtedly a pivotal year for the Beatles. There's this concerted push 
to get them out of Liverpool, to get them onto radio, onto television. But also, ultimately, the real goal was to get them a recording contract. That's how 1962 began, with a lot of promise, but not yet clear on exactly how it was all going to happen. I'm a professional Beatles historian, and I spent all my days researching the Beatles um, and trying to find out things I, I didn't know yesterday. My visit here to Sotheby's today is a good day for me because I've seen quite a few things that I didn't think I would ever get to see. This is the first management contract between Brian Epstein and the four Beatles, who were then John, George, Paul and Pete from January 1962. This is not quite the Magna Carta, but it's close. Brian Epstein who was the manager of a local record shop, entered their world and offered them the chance of management. He said, I believe you're going to be bigger than Elvis and I would like to help you achieve it. Let me be your manager. So after a very short period of discussion, the Beatles said to Brian, OK, you can manage us. J.W. Lennon, George Harrison, James Paul McCartney and Randolph Peter Best. And that's where Brian Epstein should have signed it, but he didn't sign it. He was a remarkably fair man, Brian. Most managers, especially of a hot property as the Beatles were about to be, would have tried to lock them in and make sure that they couldn't get out. But he, on the contrary, was ensuring that they had a way out if they wanted one. Almost everything in this contract is in their favour. He reduced the upper limit of the commission from 20 to 15% because Paul said, I thought managers only took 15, which was a bit of a bluff, but Brian was willing to give. Well, the Hamburg scene ended up being instrumental in the development of the British rock and roll scene. The Beatles had a history of going to Hamburg. Um, this predated Brian Epstein's arrival in their lives. Their final three trips to Hamburg were all for the Star Club, the big new venue on the Grosse Freiheit. And these were the first and only Hamburg contracts negotiated for them by Brian Epstein. It's a great opportunity for me to see the originals of these three contracts. I've never seen them before. And to actually look at the clauses of them. Brian was a great stickler for making sure the Beatles were respected wherever they played. And these contracts actually do show you that. This is the magazine that I've been familiar with since my childhood. Here in its raw form, in its moment, this was the one that caught all the, the sales of Beatlemania and was the stuff of bedroom walls all up and down the country. By the time November and December 62 came around, the Beatles had a record out, it was in the charts, and they did not want to go back to Hamburg. Brian pointed out to them that you could get blacklisted, and the Beatles reluctantly agreed that they would go back to Hamburg twice more. On the first of those two occasions in November, the pill was sweetened by the fact that they would be there appearing on the same bill with one of their great, great heroes, Little Richard. The final time, they were particularly frustrated because they had, by this point, made their second single, which was Please Please Me. George Martin, their record producer, had pressed the intercom button at the end of that session and said, congratulations, boys, you've just made your first number one. Hamburg was very much yesterday for the Beatles and, and Please Please Me was the tomorrow and it all happened exactly as they believed it would. All these things were hopes at the beginning of 1962. By the end of 1962 they had all been realised. So 62 was the, the complete turning point for them. Tune In covers the period before the Beatles have their immense breakthrough. It ends with them on the very edge of that. They've got their first record, Love Me Do, is out. It's been a hit. There's a swell of interest um, around the country for them. They've recorded their next record, Please Please Me. It's about to come out. And they fly home from their last trip to Germany, Hamburg. They went five times to Hamburg. And they're coming back to become... Well, they don't know it yet, but they're about to become a whole new kind of star, a whole new, uh, attain a level of celebrity that simply hasn't existed before. Not even for Elvis, who was their great idol. This is Elvis and then some. And obviously it's going to sustain forever. 
none of which is known, so there's no foresight, but it's coming. The reader will know that it's coming. So it ends there. It begins. Well, I had to decide where it should begin. And um, where do you begin a history? You can go back forever. But I just decided that I just felt that since the Beatles have a lot of Irish blood in them, um, both John, uh, John George and Paul all have Irish blood in them. I just felt that I would need to look at why there's such a lot of Irish in Liverpool. Um, and that, so I begin the book with the potato famine in the, middle of the, in the middle of the 19th century with the arrival of the Lennons into Liverpool. Uh, and in particular with the birth in 1855 of John Lennon. That's John Lennon grandfather. Um, who our John Lennon never knew because he died in 1921. But I look at his life, which is very much like the life, in, in some respects, very much like the life of his grandson. Uh, and then I look at all the family backgrounds in a kind of who do they think they are style. So I look at all their, all their family histories, which are all interesting, by the way. I mean, th the story begins interesting. It's even before they're born, it's already interesting. Uh, and the story of Liverpool in the 20th century is a truly fascinating and extraordinary story, which I greatly enjoyed researching and, 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 and writing. Um, so then I build up to the Second World War, get fairly quickly through the, through the next 100 years until 1945, by which point the parents are married. They've had these children. The Beatles are all war babies. So I look at their lives in the war. I look at Liverpool in the Second World War. And then I start following them through school days. So it goes right through their childhoods. And of course, in the teenage years, it picks up with the arrival of music in their lives, uh, American music in particular, their obsession with rock and roll. Um, but rock and roll itself, which was just so, well, it was just so completely new. Um, it came out of rhythm and blues, but in Britain, we didn't know that. So, and it, indeed in America, largely, for the white population, that wasn't known either. So I look at how rock and roll started, but I also look at what it was like to be a rock and roll fan in the 50s, which was quite tricky, quite difficult, uh, and how they then form a band. You know, they start picking up guitars and Ringo picks up drums and, and then it just all takes off from there, really. When you were starting this project, I mean, you, your, your story with the Beatles goes back to, I think, the early 1980s, doesn't it? When you were uh, well, it goes back to 1963 when I first heard them. <laughs> but uh, in terms of um, researching them, it goes yeah. back to 1979. Yeah. So I've been researching them now for nearly 40 years, uh, with uh, probably the rest of my life still to come. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so when you started this monumental book project, because this is the, only, the first of, of, of three volumes, Epstein. Mm. What is your initial thoughts when you're thinking about the Beatles when you were first starting this project about Epstein? What was your relationship with Epstein? I mean, we've seen him in, in Anthony Wars, I think it's a rather lovely film, um, mm. the second half of the world. Many people providing their own reminiscences and, um, and you know, representations of Epstein. But what, what was he for you? What were you thinking about when you first went? Um, he, I knew he was complicated, obviously. Um, I felt certain that he had been misrepresented on the printed page. I think probably the best attempt to tell his story was this film, mm -hmm. um, which was 1998, and which I saw when it went out and had seen a couple of times since then. But I just felt sure, back in the 1980s, I was researcher to Ray Coleman, the rock biographer. And I, in fact, wanted to write a biography of Brian, but didn't feel that I had the ability to do biographies. So I was better at researching in those days. And um, so I encouraged Ray to write it, and I did his research. And the reason for the book was because Brian was not a well-understood person. In fact, he was beginning to be more and more misunderstood. Um, and he is dogged by myths that, that um, of, of mismanagement and 25% and, and all that kind of thing. Some people out there kind of have this feeling that he made some calamitous mistakes. Um, and I just felt there was much, much more to the picture than that. So I got Ray, or I helped Ray to write that book, but it wasn't the book it could have been. 
And um, so when I embarked on this three volume history, I knew that I had to try to get the Brian Epstein history as accurate as possible. Yeah. I'd tell it as faithfully as possible um, with, well, sympathy wouldn't be quite the right word because I'm not looking to paint him in a good light any more than I'm looking to paint him in a bad light. I just want to try to get him right. And it is difficult mm. because he was a complicated man. Yeah. Um, but I think I, with the first volume, with Tune In, Brian features significantly. And I explain, for example, the way he set about managing the Beatles. In this film, we skirt over the first year of his management in pretty much the yeah. blink of an eye. That's not a criticism, they're making a film, it's a different discipline, yeah. but obviously with a book like this that covers life almost in real time, I very much wanted to look at how Brian managed the Beatles. He managed them with an extraordinary sense of verve, belief, passion, love, um, and devotion. Mm. Uh, and in the first year, having never managed any pop artists, whatever you want to call them, any musicians before, he did a superlative job. And the year ends with them on the cusp of their first number one, um, which he has very much helped build up. Yeah. Uh, the talent is theirs, but it needed shaping, it needed corralling, and, and that's what Brian gave them. So I will, in the next two volumes, uh, continue to tell Brian's story. Um, and it will continue to, to surprise yeah. people.